The Agenda with Steve Pakin is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism. Almost four months ago, Russia shocked the world with its attack on Ukraine. That war grinds on still, leaving death and displacement in its wake. Tonight, where things stand and the prospects for peace. Then, trailblazing foreign correspondent Hillary Brown is here, reflecting on some of the truly harrowing moments she depicts in her new memoir. It's called War Tourist. It's Wednesday, June 15th, and that's tonight on The Agenda. In February, Russia's President Vladimir Putin called it a special military operation, as he continues to do. But for most of the established democracies of the world, particularly in the NATO alliance, the attack on Ukraine clearly amounted to an appalling and unjustifiable war. Against the odds, Ukraine is still fighting. Let's find out where things stand. With us now for their insights, and as is our custom here, we'll introduce our guests from furthest away to closest to our studio, starting in the nation's capital with... Rafal Rohazinski, Senior Fellow at CG, the Center for International Governance Innovation and a principal of the SecDev Group, where he leads its geopolitical digital risk practice. In Windsor, Ontario, Alexander Wanoshka, Assistant Professor of International Relations at the University of Waterloo and author of the newly published book, Military Alliances in the 21st Century. And in Oshawa, Ontario, Stephanie Carvin, Associate Professor of International Relations at Carleton University and author most recently of Stand on Guard, Reassessing Threats to Canada's National Security. It's great to have you three on our program tonight to check in on a story that is uh, day by day increasingly distressing. And I think we want to start here. Sheldon, if you would, let's bring up this map here of the conflict zones in Ukraine. And apologies to those of you listening on podcast. I'll do the best I can sort of describing the state of play in Ukraine right now. But it's better to see this, obviously. The blue dots on the map, and there are blue dots on the southern eastern coast of Ukraine and in the northeastern coast of Ukraine. Lots of blue dots, which indicate significant fighting over the past 24 hours. That's what the blue dots are. Now, if we go to the red and white striped area, which is just south of Luhansk, and then in the very southeastern part of Ukraine, we see Russian-controlled Ukrainian territory before February 24th. So that's an advance of the war. Now, if you look at the orange striped area, that's assessed as Russian advances in Ukraine, the orange area. And there's lots of that north of Luhansk, and then from Kherson to Mariupol in the southeast. And then there are a couple of splotches of brown just south of Donetsk and another very small one near Kherson. And that's been assessed as Russian controlled Ukrainian territory. So those are the four different areas, all of which are in the eastern and southeastern part of Ukraine. And Alex, maybe you could get us started on sort of analyzing the significance of all of this. We were told, obviously, off the top that Kiev was going to fall in three days. Obviously, that hasn't happened. The Ukrainians are doing so much better than anybody anticipated. Tell us, based on your knowledge, how well you think they're holding up so far. I think they're holding up reasonably well, considering the circumstances. I think we're entering a fairly difficult stage, however, for Ukraine. After all, the map doesn't quite give you a good sense of the distances involved, but this is a country that would span in North America the area between Chicago, Toronto, uh, Raleigh, and New York City. And so the terrain, especially in the east and the south, are flat. It lends itself fairly easily for maneuver. Russia was able to take up a lot of those territories along those vectors. And so what we're seeing, especially in the south, is the effort on the part of Ukraine to regain parts of the Kherson Oblast. Indeed, there are recent reports of the Ukrainian armed forces advancing closer to the city. However, in the east, uh, in the Luhansk Oblast, a lot of the heaviest fighting are being seen at the moment in Severodonetsk. It is assessed that Russia has 
control of most of that city. But Ukraine is trying to attract as much as it can of Russian forces. It is not as strategically important for Ukraine as it is for Russia. For Russia, the of Donetsk is important because it guarantees the control of Luhansk Oblast. But it does provide an important opportunity for Ukraine to again, a threat Russian forces to hold them at bay and to curb further uh, advances into eastern Ukraine. Stephanie, let's talk casualties for a second. I have seen figures that suggest Ukraine is losing 100 people a day. How about on the Russian side of things? Do we know what their casualty and wounded rate is? So we we don't. We do have some estimates, some from the Ukrainians themselves. Uh, you know, most of the analysts I've seen commenting on this suggest that the, those numbers are, are likely exaggerated, and we should be very cautious. I mean, the Ukrainians, of course, are on the ground and, and, and definitely have some insights as to uh, the loss rates of of the Russian forces. But um, you know, we have seen. Uh, you know, estimates that, you know, potentially up to 20,000 Russian soldiers have been killed in this conflict, which is uh, an astonishing number if you think about it, uh, far more than what uh, the Russians actually lost in, in their fighting in Afghanistan uh, in the 1980s. So their attrition rate does seem to be relatively high. Uh, and it, but, you know, they, this is something they seem very, very determined to to keep going. They There has been, you know, some estimates as well. I mean, uh, where Ukraine has the advantage is in manpower, but not necessarily equipment. Uh, Russia has the advantage in equipment, but not necessarily manpower. Um, while they have a uh, conscript army, they are there's an agreement that the conscripts are not supposed to be fighting in this uh, war, right? Um, so the people who are fighting are, are what's called contract soldiers. These are our people. It's kind of like our, our volunteer-based army. And Russia has been trying to recruit more and more individual offering large amounts of money for, for short periods of, of, of contract fighting for individuals with military experience. But uh, we shouldn't be under any illusion that the losses on, on both sides are, are pretty grave. Rafal, let's talk about your area of expertise, which is cyber and cyber war. And cyber war, interestingly enough, hasn't so far uh, been as dominant on the battlefield, if I can use that metaphor, as many had suspected it would be. And you helped Ukraine invest in its internet infrastructure back in the day. I wonder if you can tell us how effectively Ukrainians have employed cyber warfare methods so far. Well, it's a great question, Steve, and I think it comes back to the fact that this is the first war where cyberspace is actually part of a conflict between two industrialized power powers. And to say that cyber hasn't played a role is, is to sort of misstate the case. The reality is that Ukraine came under a fairly significant cyber attack in the opening days of the war, including an attack against um, a satellite provider, which basically knocked out not just satellite services in Ukraine, but for most of Europe. I think the significant that we've seen this, however, has been the use of cyber military capabilities. And these are something that we haven't seen in previous conflicts, but really have accounted for the fact that Ukraine's relatively lightly armed forces have done significant damage to a trillion dollar investment made in the Russian military over the last decade. Uh, the fact that we've seen over 12 general staff officers targeted and killed in artillery strikes, the fact that we've seen significant losses against frontline Russian troops um, can be attributed to the fact that we have intelligence that uses cyber means in order to target that. Secondly, you know, we've had cyber now playing a much more global perspective. We've had economic sanctions, which have targeted Russia's ability to use basic IT and programs that are necessary for its military production, and which in the long term are going to have a significant impact in reducing its ability to generate the kind of force that we'll need if it's going to meet the minimum objectives that it has uh, for Ukraine at the moment. A quick follow-up, though, Rafal. Would you say that, and, and I guess the, the, um, the comment I made off the top uh, refers to actually a previous program that we did here where, where uh, the guests suggested that, that cyber was not as significant a part of the battlefield as they expected it would be. And so my follow-up is, in spite of what you say, it hasn't been decisive yet, has it? It's not been indecisive in the way that we maybe expected cyber war to be, um, even a few months ago when we thought that this would be uh, hooded ha uh, hackers taking down critical infrastructure within cities. That's not the way that it's played out. We've seen cyber on the battlefield, but we haven't used, seen it used in the way that it was prior to the conflict, mainly as a, a weapon of mass distraction rather than destruction. Hmm. All right. Stephanie, I want to come back to uh, not necessarily cyber war, but uh, but actual long-range weaponry. 
uh, which the Ukrainians are asking NATO for. And obviously, NATO has got to weigh the pros and cons of doing so. Maybe you could lay out the arguments for us on why we either should or shouldn't supply the Ukrainian army with long-range weapons. Well, it's not even so much uh, the the willingness to, to do so. I think that there is an understanding that, uh, or at least we saw uh, earlier this month, that there is an agreement between uh, Ukraine and the United States that if these long-range weapons are used, they will not be used against Russian territory. And I think that's always been the concern um, for NATO states in this entire conflict is escalation. It's one of the reasons we haven't seen NATO forces uh, provide planes, for example, to Ukraine, because there's concern that, you know, um, if, if NATO is seen as doing so, it might just be a little too much uh, and it could provoke a, a much stronger response from Russia. So that's I think that the main consideration is, is avoiding escalation. But there's there's so many other factors here as well. I mean, at first, what we saw was a lot of Eastern European states giving their kind of Soviet era equipment to the Ukrainians because, of course, they were familiar with those kinds of weapons. And as they're asking for these more sophisticated devices, there there's a a lot that goes there. I mean, you can provide these weapons, but do the Ukrainian forces know how to use them, right? So then you're kind of trying to fr frantically train them. You can provide uh, a lot of equipment, but do they have the trucks and infrastructure necessary to actually bring those uh, pieces of equipment safely to the battlefront? That's another issue here as well. So there's so many other factors um, in terms of just, it, it's not so much of just simply providing weapons. It's also ensuring that, you know, the Ukrainians, it, it, you know, if you're going to go this route, if they can actually use them in an effective way? Um, and secondly, can they actually get them to the front? And these are the things that I think are kind of the choke point right now. We're hearing a lot of, of you know, uh, you know uh, Alex spoke a lot about the, uh, the fighting that's happening in the east of the country. A lot of that, um, you know, this is why we're hearing the Ukrainians put more and more pressure on the West, I think, for weapons. But it's not we can't just dump them on them, even if we want to. It's a matter of, of training, um, getting them the you know tech support even is, is a huge issue. And then also if they can even get those weapons to the front line safely. Alexander, I want to get your view on this. Do you think it's fair for NATO to ask the Ukrainians, who, after all, are fighting for their lives and their fu the future of their country, is it fair to ask them to put these conditions on NATO's providing long-range weaponry to them? I think it's very tricky because Russia has been launching air and uh, cruise missile attacks from Russian territory. And so Ukraine is forced to fight with uh, one hand tied behind its back. And indeed, um, this has been an issue since the very beginning of the so-called special military operations since February 24th. I understand the reasons uh, for concern with respect to escalation. I think Ukraine uh, itself is very tuned to those risks too. Uh, that being said they have launched attacks on Russian territory, especially in and around Belgorod. And it does not appear that those attacks have precipitated some major uh, Russian military response that would mean further escalation. So the escalation question is very tricky. Uh, the concern is real. There are many who do share them. But I think um, we have seen Russia not exactly act on particular threats to escalate over the course of this particular conflict, uh, despite increasing amounts of Western military assistance to Ukraine. Rafal, I mean, this may be an overly simplistic question, but clearly Russia has no problem attacking Ukrainian territory. Why should we put the handcuffs on Ukraine and prevent them from attacking Russian territory? Well, this is a really interesting question if we look at cyberspace, because unlike the uh, weapons that are used in kinetic space, cyber weapons, frankly, respect no borders. And one of the interesting features in this conflict has been Ukraine's very successful crowdsourcing of cyber attacks against critical Russian infrastructure. This has been ongoing over the last 100 days, has taken offline most Russian government uh, websites, as well as some critical infrastructure, and in fact prompted the head of Roscosmos, uh, Dmitry Rogozin, to state that if space assets were attacked by cyber attack, then Russia would respond up to the level of escalation as if it was being uh, threatened for its uh, existence. Uh, Russian military doctrine, interestingly enough, makes very little distinction between the use of cyber weapons or nuclear weapons as they pertain to the national security of Russia. And there's a very, very big legal question right now on whether or not the West's support for cyber attacks against Russia, even though this is largely uh, a kind of a, a, a support that doesn't limit individuals from joining in this, uh, this, these kinds of cyber attacks, 
whether that makes them effectively co-belligerents in the conflict at a much higher level than through the supply of arms. So this is an interesting question um, that I think is going to unfold as this conflict continues. Stephanie, let me get you to weigh in on how do you see the cyber war going so far? Uh, you know, it's interesting. When we say cyber, what do we mean? There's so many different kind of aspects, and, and obviously we, we've heard uh, quite a few of them, whether you know we're talking about the actual ability to take critical infrastructure offline, whether we're talking about uh, the ability to, um, you know, uh, just even maintain the internet in, in Ukraine. The fact that, you know, Ukraine didn't lose, I, I think one of the things we all thought would happen within the first 72 hours is Ukraine would lose control over its communications. That never happened. I mean, we can have a debate to the extent that uh, Elon Musk is responsible for that in terms of providing uh, internet satellite. And I'd be interested in hearing um, um, the others, the other speakers on that. But uh, there's other aspects to this as well. Um, we heard, for example, the electronic warfare aspect of this, which is you know the ability to actually target some of the commanders on the ground because they're using unencrypted communication devices. Uh, this has been a huge failure on the Russian side is to provide secure communications to its forces, and it's enabled, I think, some of the the targeting, particularly in the early stages of this operation. And the final aspect of this to me that's really interesting is the information aspect of this. Um, you know, we've heard for years uh, talk about hybrid warfare, um, you know, the, the so-called Gerasimov doctrine, which, you know, there's a, a military analyst, uh, Michael Kaufman, he calls it the junk drawer of ideas. But I, I de this idea that Russia could actually dominate the information space and help induce kind of a uh, a surrender mentality uh, of the enemy, that they would be able to come in and, and, and dominate communications. And, and this really didn't happen. And that's one of the really curious puzzles to me um, of this entire, uh, you know, special military operation. The fact that, you know, uh, a lot of the Russia, at least in Ukraine and certainly in the West has not been able to to muddy the information waters. There's some, you know, speculation and, and, and some concern that, you know, Russia is winning the information war in places like China, places like Asia, places like Africa. But um, by and large, I think there's a pretty clear global narrative that Russia invaded Ukraine, um, that, you know, this is, you know, a lot of the turbulence is, is the fault of, of this invasion. Uh, and where we go from here, uh, I'm not entirely sure. We may see Russia improve Prove its information operations as, as we go through uh, this conflict, as it does actually manage to make gains in the east of the country. But that that's yes to be seen. Rafal, I can't let that Elon Musk comment go by without getting you to comment on that. Is Has Elon Musk played a role in this war? I think he has. I mean, it's clearly that Starlink has provided capabilities that otherwise weren't available. But I think there's a bigger story here, too. Look, let's not forget that since 2014, uh, Ukraine has been the most targeted country in the world in terms of state-based uh, cyber attacks, whether that's attacks against critical infrastructure that made the lights go out in Kiev twice, uh, whether it's malware that was introduced into the financial system that basically locked up pretty well at every point of sale in Ukraine at one point in time. Um, industry has stepped up. Microsoft and other companies have used effectively Ukraine as a, as a training ground for some of their more advanced techniques. Uh, we've seen very quiet but very effective assistance through the U.S. Cyber Command in ensuring that critical aspects of the infrastructure would not go down in terms of the conflict. And finally, you've seen Ukrainians themselves, who are, let's not forget, a pretty technically sophisticated nation, take steps to make sure that uh, the infrastructure would continue operating. The last point, I think, goes to Stephanie's, is the fact that this whole invasion, let's not forget, going back to February, was a pretty hubristic exercise on the part of the Russians. It's pretty clear now that there wasn't really good operational planning, um, and at least the first wave of the, of the invasion was, was going to be seen as a triumphal drive through uh, Kiev uh, with welcoming crowds um, effectively calling for a change in regime. The fact that we had very little electronic warfare um, is only one of the many pillars of a successful and well-planned military operation that was entirely absent in February and only belatedly has started to be put into place in the much more narrow and much more difficult fighting in the Donbass. Hmm. Donbass. Alexander, I want you, if you would, to start us off in some discussion about Ukraine's allies right now. And by that, I mean inflation is really uh, very problematic right now. Gas prices, I don't have to tell anybody watching this or listening to this what they're doing right now. There's a global wheat shortage because farmers can't get their crops going out of Ukraine right now. What kind of pressure is this war putting on Ukraine's allies in your judgment? 
It's putting a lot of pressure. I think, though, we have to make distinctions among uh, the partners that Ukraine uh, does have. Those uh, closest to it, namely Poland and the Baltic countries, as well as the United States and the United Kingdom and Canada, for that matter, have been pretty good at providing bilateral assistance, as well as various forms of military assistance. Indeed, those countries in NATO closest to Ukraine have been very good at providing Soviet military equipment. And indeed, they are concerned, as the Ukrainians are, that Western uh, geostrategic attention will dissipate and that there will be a, a growing sense of the need to put pressure on Ukraine to come to some sort of ceasefire to get back to business as usual with Russia. That certainly may be the case in some parts of Western Europe. There was a recent poll indicating that concerns over peace might actually triumph over concerns over justice with this particular war. But it's not entirely clear how decisive such public opinion polling might actually have on decision makers. Indeed, France has actually been fairly clear in recent days that does want Ukraine to prevail, to win, to restore its territorial integrity, and that indeed the French economy will do what it can to help service Ukraine's military needs. Let me do a quick follow-up with you, Alex, and that is, do you think it is actually part of the mission by Russia to create a global famine in its efforts to defeat Ukraine? I think that's a reasonable statement to make at this point. Indeed, uh, the head of the African Union had met with Putin not very long ago, adopted very politically neutral language, asking about how Russia could provide relief. And then the very next day, uh, Russia targeted grain terminals that indeed further compound the issue that we're seeing with respect to food insecurity and grain shortages. It might be very difficult uh, in the absence of direct documentary evidence to uh, identify this particular motivation, but the tactics being used by Russia, some of the behavior that we have been seeing on the part of Russia, not least involving uh, the theft of grain and trying to ship them to destinations in North Africa, do show that Russia is indeed trying to weaponize uh, food insecurity for its own strategic gain. Uh, Stephanie, I mean, it's not like Russia hasn't in the past tried to create famine in countries. They tried it in Ukraine, obviously under Joseph Stalin. But do, do you think it's accurate to say that part of the mission here by Russia is to create global food insecurity? So I have to agree with Alex that, you know, without direct proof, it's hard to know exactly what uh, Putin is thinking. I think what we can say is that if there is a famine as a result of his invasion of Ukraine, he does not seem to be too bothered by it. And certainly he does not seem to be looking for solutions. The, the concern right now, of course, is that there are mines around Odessa, right? Uh, and those mines have been placed there by the Ukrainians. And, you know, so basically the problem is we can't get ships to those ports. And the problem is as well is that there's not enough rail capacity in Ukraine to get all the grain that's there that's been harvested out to global markets. So really the, the most efficient and best way is through these ships. But, you know, Ukraine doesn't want to remove the mines for a number of reasons. I mean, even if Russia is unable to invade um, you know, uh, uh, some of the ports uh, in uh, either Odessa or the other parts of, of the country, uh, that the the fact is that they will not be, uh, you know, th there's concern that if they remove their mines, that the Russians will just simply replace them with their own mines. Um, it's also problems with regards to ensuring shipping and things like this. So, I mean, this is the other part of the story that we, we do hear less about is that, you know, the economic devastation uh, on Ukraine as a result of this conflict is, is going to be bad. Uh, the global impact of this is going to be bad. Um, you know, we focus so much on, on the Russian sanctions and whether or not they're working that sometimes I think that we're not seeing just, um, you know, this other side of this conflict, which is that, it, you know, just how hard it's going to be for the Ukrainian people to, to really live uh, through, you know, the winter of 22, 23. Alexander, can you help us understand this? Because, you know, presumably every country around the world, even Russia, wants to make friends. Why would it be in Putin's interest to create a global food shortage, which presumably most of the world would put at Putin's feet? I think he believes that in so doing, it would put pressure on the part of Western governments that would to 
induce pressure on Ukraine uh, to come to some sort of ceasefire agreement that will be uh, favorable to Russia. And indeed, Ukraine has resisted those sorts of calls precisely because it feels quite reasonably, in my view, that any such ceasefire would largely benefit Russia insofar as it would provide the opportunity to regroup, to reposition itself, and to reconsolidate its military forces. So Putin is happy to perhaps take the blame because at the end of the day, what's really important for him is to try to consolidate territorial control over Ukraine and to split Ukraine away from its Western partners. Okay, let's talk sanctions. Rafal, get us started here. Uh, I know there was certainly a sentiment a while ago that said uh, Russia's making a fortune selling its gas all over the world, so let's just not buy their gas and starve them out. And obviously, there are too many Western economies that depend on that, so that strategy was not available. Having said that, are there other sanctions that the West has imposed on Russia that actually do have teeth and are working? Well, this, this is, a, again, a great question. It ties into your last one. Um, we have to be mindful of the way that the Russians narrate this conflict as well. Um, and although they've been careful in terms of calling it a special military operation in order to emphasize the fact that this is their sovereign right and that they don't recognize Ukrainian sovereignty over the territories that they're currently fighting over, they really do see it as a global conflict. And economic sanctions against Russia and responses to those sanctions, including the weaponization of food deliveries, is seen as basically fair target and fair game. Now, on the sanctions questions in Russia, there have been a number of ways that this has really affected things and, and continues to do in Russia, one of which is the sanctions that have been put against IT industries. Um, again, getting to the point of the effectiveness of cyber war, it takes millions of dollars and a lot of skill to create malware that can attack, attack a banking system, for example. However, if you withdraw a license agreement for Oracle, you can disable 400 banks in Eurasia pretty well overnight. And the Russians are very mindful of this. So they see the weaponization of economic sanctions um, as yet another front that the West can use and are taking pretty considerable steps to try to minimize their losses. The challenge, of course, is that especially in the tech industry, and whether we're talking software or talking hardware, it is a monopolized global industry. Russian military buys most of its microprocessors from a single plant in Taiwan which means that the vulnerabilities are there both for us to exploit as well as for the Russians to respond against. And as a result, this tit for tat of economic sanctions, weaponization of food versus sanctions against Russia's IT industry, as an example, is something that we can expect to unfold as this conflict protracts. Less than four minutes to go here. And Stephanie, let me get you to follow up in this regard. I mean, we've seen Canadian, the Canadian government sanction Russians in one particular way, such as to say, Here's a list of people that are no longer allowed to come from Russia to Canada. And I can just imagine the Russians are quaking in their boots at the thought that, oh my goodness, we, poor us, we can't travel to Canada anymore. So, I mean, have we actually put any sanctions in place that have got any teeth? Yeah, actually, and in some ways, we've actually been leading some of the ideas about sanctions. And, uh, you know, under our current legislation, we actually have the ability to not only seize funds in uh, Canada of, uh, you know, Russian or Russian affiliated um, organizations, and then we can give that money actually back to Ukraine. And but have we Canada done it? We can do it. Have uh, we actually done it? Uh, we have seized the assets, absolutely. Mm. Um, but I think the bigger issue here is that uh, we do actually lack sanctions enforcement. And this is one of the things that kind of drives me uh, bananas, and maybe we can do it a whole other episode about. But, um, you know, we, we can say, okay, these people can't come here, they can't use Canada for their banking services, they can't buy Canadian products, all these kinds of things. But we actually don't really have the capacity to enforce these uh, mechanisms. And I think that's a real issue. It's that it's very hard for Canadian authorities to actually follow uh, the chain of, of, of money, of people. And so, for example, if someone is ordering Canadian goods through Dubai, for example, they may very well get away with it because we just can't do that follow-up. So I think one of the big things we need to do as a result of this conflict, and, and really just to be a good international citizen, is to actually put more capacity behind our sanctions regime. We have the laws, we just actually need the kind of manpower and resources to enforce them in a much bigger way. Hmm. Alexander, I want to put to you one of the uh, long-standing maxims that one hears about uh, the former Soviet Union then and now Russia today, which is never underestimate the ability of the Russian people to sustain considerable amounts of suffering for long periods of time. If that is the case, is that Russia's ace in the hole to eventually win this war? 
Well, I think we have to take a fairly broad view of what sanctions do. So sanctions may simply punish and reinforce red lines, as well as to uh, denounce certain actions that have already happened. But, and this is something that Rafa had already uh, mentioned, they do have an effect uh, maybe not so much on getting the population to rise up against uh, the Kremlin, that I think is a total order in this particular scenario, but to have fairly diffuse effects on the ability of the Russian military industrial um, complex, if I could dare say that uh, phrase, to deliver particular technologies or particular armaments. So, for example, what we're seeing already is uh, Russia not having precision technologies that it can use on the battlefield for maximal effectiveness. Indeed, it seems to be fairly uh, low in its stocks of precision-guided munitions. And indeed, a lot of the artillery strikes that Russia is undertaking uh, to this day uh, lack precision and lack accuracy in a way that is uh, fairly helpful for Ukraine. And indeed, the sanctions put on Russia since 2014 have been useful for attributing various aspects of Russian military uh, modernization in a way that, again, has benefited Ukraine. Rafal, let me give you the last 30 seconds on that issue. Uh, are, are the Russians depending on their population being able to sustain whatever suffering Putin imposes upon them? Well, let me give you a big answer here. There's a real danger in reducing complexity to a question of good or bad. Um, the reality is that there are many, many reasons why this conflict took place, and the map that you showed at the beginning could well have meant being the map of Ukraine's electoral politics in 2012. Russia has basically staked, and Putin has staked in particular, his political future on this project. Um, if he loses, then there's a big question mark in terms of what happens internally to Russia. For Ukraine, the question is really whether or not they can win by simply not losing. And that's the question that we're all going to be facing. But there's no doubt that we're right now in what Russia sees as a global war, where the weaponization of all is going to be part of what they see as an existential uh, fight over the future of what they see as being Russian civilization. And that's a big question and a big challenge for Ukraine and all of us to have to deal with. I want to thank the three of you for coming on to TVO tonight and sharing your uh, very eminent views on what is the... Um, one of the most tragic stories of our time, Alexander Wonoshka from the University of Waterloo, Stephanie Carvin, Carleton University, Rafael Rohozinski from CG. Thanks so much to the three of you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. For almost four decades, for both Canadian and American television networks, Hillary Brown went where few women had gone before, war zones in Vietnam, Pakistan, El Salvador, and beyond. She was witness to some of the defining moments of the 20th and 21st centuries and played a part in writing the first draft of that history. She details it all in her new memoir. It's called War Tourist, Memoirs of a Foreign Correspondent. It's filled with both the hair-raising and the effervescent moments of what has been an exhilarating life and career. And Hillary Brown joins us now here in our studio. So lovely to see you again. And it's lovely to be with you again, Steve. I'm going to show uh, some of your work off the top here, which even uh -oh. all these years later, I uh -oh. cannot believe. <laughs> oh, you ready? On. Here come we on. go. Sheldon, if you would. Warning to everybody, this is graphic. Much of the American commissary on the other side of the bridge was destroyed in this fighting. An undisclosed number of soldiers were wounded and killed. The communist commandos seemed to fire at anything that moved on and around the bridge, including this small corps of newsmen and women who were foolish enough to get themselves caught in the crossfire. For us, it seemed a good place not to be. Unless something happens very quickly on the political front here, there's every indication that the Battle of Saigon may be about to begin. The soldiers behind me are firing at Vietnam units who are 500 yards away, no more. This is the closest the fighting's ever come to Saigon since the communist offensive in 1968. Sorry, ABC News, Saigon. That's yeah. April 27th, 1975, and I have a three-letter question for you, Hillary. WTF? What the... <laughs> what, what, like... No, Why? you have to Why? do it. Well, it, it was very historic, actually, because it was it was the closest the communist forces had got to Saigon since the Tet Offensive of 1968. And then it was actually on the very eve 
of the communist takeover of the city, which but took you, place a day later. You did not have to be there. No, I didn't have to be there. Why were you there? Because you're, you're, you're compelled to, to be there. You get so excited by the, you know, the story itself. You know, and, and that th th this is historic. This, this is, this is good. They're going to love this in New York. This is, this is. I'm, a, I'm writing the first draft of history. All, all these, you know, crazy, rather, rather self, um, self-regarding illusions that you have. But you're just sort of driven to, to, to cover it, to go there, to be there, to put yourself on camera. And in this, play, in this instance, I seem more sensible to do my stand-up lying down, because of the crossfire. You know, we could have maybe stopped a bullet. Does it occur to you at that moment that this might be the last stand-up I ever do? Uh, no, no, not at all, not at all. No, it didn't, no. Mm -hmm. it, it, what occurs to you is, I'm getting this, I'm getting this story, and we're, we've got to get it out, and this is great. No, you, you run on a kind of adrenaline when these things happen, really, and, and your own physical danger, the risk, is, is sort of in the back of your mind. Do you know why you are wired to kind of get off in that situation as opposed to be terrified by it and want to be nowhere near it? I, I think it's just that I am, I'm kind of a news junkie. Well, so are you. But not I, to do that kind. Well, well, maybe, I don't know. But uh, yes, I always was a news junkie and, and foreign news is what really interested me because most of the time foreign news ended up being headline news. So they're big stories generally. They're stories that affect uh, you know, quite often whole nations or whole regions. And so you, you felt that you really were, um, you know, a, a bearing witness to something important and that you were, you were bringing that story to, to the viewer. And all of that is, you know, tremendously exciting and a great privilege, too. Ironically, for someone who says she sort of fell into being a foreign correspondent, how did that happen? Fell in. Well, I, I, I did actually from quite an early age. I mean, the age of, what, 26, 27, I... I really did want to be a foreign correspondent, not believing that I ever would. Because at that time, and that's sort of the late 60s, and there was a prejudice against women in news. I mean, and not just from pure misogyny, but I think that the, the male executives actually were afraid. You know, they didn't want to put women in ha harm's way. And I think they were quite sincere about that. So, yeah, from the age of about 26, that's what I really wanted to do. And at the time, I was doing what we call public affairs broadcasting for CBC in uh, Montreal, you know, interviewing people who turn Javix bottles into piggy banks. <laughs> <laughs> Not the most compelling kind of work. No. So it was really, uh, I, I ended up getting into foreign news reporting by enterprising myself as a freelancer, and I got myself into a war zone, which at the time happened to be Pakistan, just before the outbreak of their war with India in 1971. How many war zones for you? Well, I, I, I think about, it depends what you call a war zone, but it would be about 12, from 12 to 19, hmm. depending on what you call a war zone. Can I ask you about Iran? Yeah. You came well, pretty close to death in Iran. Yes, did you I not? did. That, that was one of my, I mean, I, I, many correspondents and people who are in foreign news think of themselves as having maybe nine lives. And you sort of calculate, well, how many lives have you used up already? And the Iran experience was definitely one of those lives for sure. I was um, covering the Iranian revolution. Uh, the people were in a state of hysteria. And we uh, went to a, a, a western town called Tabriz, where they were having what seemed to be a kind of insurrection. And at the time, you covered anything that moved in Iran. This was at the time that uh, 104 American hostages were being held by so-called students in Iran. So it was, it was a big, huge story. 1979. It's 1979. So we, we went there as a, just a three-man team with, a, with an interpreter. And, uh, it was something like a coup going on, so I thought, well, I should go, we, we got to go where the, where the action is. And I always go where my crew goes. I'm not a person to say, you go there and get the shots and I'll, I'll just stand here and wait. So I, I just went into one of these crowds and was immediately swallowed up by this all-male mob who began to maul me, basically. Maul me. And, and nobody, no one, not the police, not the army, had they been there, which they were not, could have got me out of that situation. It was just one person somehow in the crowd that decided, okay, let her go. And then they all let me go, and then it got out. Did you think that was curtains at yes, that moment? Yes, I did. And I just given birth to my beautiful son, Jonathan. <laughs> I mean, I, I had a four-month-old baby. And, and you know what I thought, Steve? It was not, I'm scared, I'm scared. I thought, how could you be so stupid? How could you do this to your child, to your newborn child? How could you have misread this mob? It was all guilt, guilt, self-reproach. 
you know, the fear was not even there, really. It was, it was yeah, self-reproach. You, you had a conversation with your husband, John Bierman, the wonderful journalist, yes. author, yes. before going. Yes. Did he try to talk you out of going? Absolutely. Of course and? he did. He said, Hill, you can't go. And I, you know, obviously, he knows that, um, you know, if I want to go, I'm going to go. And he, so he did not talk me out of it. Of course, he was right, because he had been there. He had gone in for BBC and NBC before I went in. So he knew, you know, how, how volatile a place was. So why didn't you listen to him? I, well, I never really listened to him. <laughs> <laughs> that might have been one of the secrets to your successful marriage, right? Yeah, possibly. <laughs> possibly. He gave advice and you yeah, mostly listen, disregarded yes, it. Yes, I listen very nicely to what he has to say <laughs> and then I do exactly what I want. Yeah. I wonder if there's a part of you, even today, with what's going on in Ukraine, that mm -hmm. wishes, I want to be over there covering that. Well, yeah, of course. I mean, it's the biggest story since World War II. I, I think, I mean, it's a, it's a huge story. It's the story of the century, certainly of the decade. But on the other hand, you know, I know what the demands on reporters are now. And, you know, there, there's all these electronic, electronic platforms that you have to serve. It's not just do your, do your piece for radio and television. No, 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 it's do the Facebook and the Instagram and the Twitter and all that. Mm. And you know how talented I am technologically, <laughs> don't you, Steve? Ooh. So I know that I wouldn't last a day there. Not a day. And also, I am so full of admiration for the women who are out there now. I mean, they're just dynamite, all of them. I wouldn't stand a chance against them. But you it's know. interesting you still have that instinct to want to be there. Oh, yeah, of course. And of course, so I watch it obsessively. I read about it mm. obsessively. Yeah, for sure. When you were in the field, and I'm, we're going back to now, uh, let's say at the beginning, in your 20s and 30s, yeah. how many other female foreign correspondents would you run into in the course of doing your daily duties? None. You were Almost it. Almost none. Yeah. Pretty much. There was uh, uh, someone called um, Liz Trotta of NBC. Mm -hmm. That was pretty much on the American networks, yeah, it, it, that was pretty much the only one. Where you saw a lot of women were the photographers, the snappers, mm -hmm. people like Françoise de Mulder and Catherine Loire, all won prizes and uh, they both since, have since died. But uh, the, the more, there were more, the women were really as snappers at that time, as photographers. Um, but then uh, once they got going, those women can't stop them. Hmm. <laughs> Hillary, there's a line in your book that, uh, well, there's a lot of lines that stayed with me, but this one in particular. For us to have a good day, someone else has to have a bad day or the last day of their lives. Mm -hmm. And I wonder how much guilt you sort of carry with you that you had a wonderfully exciting career in journalism at mm -hmm. the expense of many very sad people. Yes, I, I, I certainly do. And, and I call a book War Tourist because I think that that is the definition of a foreign correspondent. They are, we are like war tourists in flak jackets. We document human misery and then we move on. We move on because we have to. We move on to the next conflict. But we do actually carry emotional baggage of guilt. Uh, 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 about the suffering of the people that we've left behind, the suffering that we documented ourselves. And so you then, the follow-up you know, follow to that, at least in my case, was that you want to atone, you want to make amends if you can. So you try to help people when you can, or in my case, I managed to, to sponsor an entire family of Vietnamese boat people to Canada um, in 1990 by way of atonement for leaving behind my translator and his family in Saigon in 1975. That was atonement on your part, you it, think? Absolutely, totally. I felt guilty about that for 15 years, mm -hmm. and it was a tremendous relief for me that I was able to get that family out. They've been in you know, this, this camp for seven years, living in packing crates, by the way, you know, hmm. living lives of misery. And that was more than 30 years ago. Do you know what's yeah. become of that family since? Yes. Yes, I've kept in touch with them. And the baby of that family has just got her PhD at McMaster University. Wow. Yeah, and she asked me, would I, would I uh, be present for her defense, the oral defense, which of course I did. Isn't that <laughs> spectacular? Yeah. Brian Stewart, whom you well know, of course, uh, another great uh, Canadian foreign correspondent, has been really quite open about having suffered from PTSD from all of the misery that he has seen over the years, famine in Ethiopia, war zones, etc. Do you carry any of that as well? 
No, I don't think I ever have. No, I never had PTSD. And Brian Stewart, of course, is an absolute hero for me because he wrote a wonderful review of this book, War Tourist, in the Literary Review of Canada, putting me in the same category as people like Martha Gellhorn and, and, and um, uh, Claire Hollingsworth. But no, I don't really think I did. I did have a period of clinical depression, which lasted on and off for three years, but that was because of a fall on my head, I got a concussion. Mm. And as we know, you know, you can develop <laughs> clinical depression from concussion. It can be a delayed reaction to concussion, and that's what happened to me. So for those three years, I was, you know, worked sort of on and off, and ABC was medevacking me out of places all the time. This is, you were in your 50s at the time. I was in, in my 50s, and, yes. And uh, I'm trying to remember now, it, it, some fancy pants doctor in London, England said, you should have shock therapy. That, that's yeah. right, yes. Yes, because I didn't respond to the medication he gave me. He said, oh, I don't know what to do with you. I'll give you shock treatment, <laughs> which I thought was a bit extreme, and I walked out of his office And you did not John. do? No, I said, this guy's crazier than we are, or than I am. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You have this fantastic career in being a foreign correspondent, and then one day you decide you're going to come home and you're going to be the anchor of the 6 o'clock CBC Supper Hour News mm -hmm in Toronto, and I happen to have been one of your reporters well, at the time. Well, exactly. That's where we met. And I remember thinking to myself, this woman could do anything in journalism. Why is she coming here? And what yeah. was the answer? Well, the answer was really, again, my son, Jonathan, who, by the way, did the cover of this book. I've got to throw in that plug because I think it's absolutely brilliant. But he was then four. And I calculated that with ABC, I was on the road at least 70% of the time. So I only saw him for about 30% of the time. And this really, you know, got to me, actually. And at that, just at the same time, I get a call from uh, someone at CBC in Toronto saying, uh, I called Howard Bernstein, who we both know very well, saying, uh, He's admired my work for, for many years, and would I consider coming up to anchor a local news program in Toronto? And, and I, I thought, yeah, maybe this is what I should do. Then I'd be home for my son. I'd still work. Uh, they made a very nice offer where I was able to travel a bit, and uh, you know, I could do long-form uh, news reports. So I don't, I don't regret doing that at all. I do not regret doing that, and it was a pretty good newsroom. Wasn't it, Steve? Uh, I would you say so. You were in it, and it <laughs> produced a lot of people who went on, uh, you know, to, to, to network jobs. And, uh, no, it was a good little newsroom. It was probably the grottiest news space or workspace I'd ever worked in. Well, I, I, I seem to remember you saying all the time, I've worked in third world yeah, countries that had better <laughs> physical right. plants than this. Well, it's yeah. true, because that was before the big plant was, before the big was broadcast built, thing. and we were operating out of a hopeless jumble of antiquated buildings mm -hmm. infested with pigeons and rats. But as wonderful as the rest of us were to work with, and as nice a job as it is to host the CBC 6 o'clock Supper Hour newscast, uh, you know, it's not war zones, it's not the most exciting stories in the world, it's not jumping on planes mm. at the drop of a hat. H how did you kind of negotiate all of that in your head? Because it wasn't the same as what you had been accustomed to. No, well, again, it really was the personal, I think it was my personal life, the personal life, that, that having given birth to this beautiful child, mm. Uh, you know, and I, my, my husband was a, had then stopped journalism. He's writing very good books. He was at home, so he could be at home wherever we were. So we could have a stable family life. And then, of course, I built up a whole circle of wonderful friends here in Toronto, who I like very much. And also, CBC did give me 10 weeks paid vacation a year, which is quite a good chunk of time. Mm -hmm. And I would use some of that time to go and do this little story abroad or that little story abroad. Mm -hmm. So. You know, it was okay. It was not a bad setup. In fact, as one of my, a lot of my friends at ABC said, you got it made, Hills. Don't <laughs> knock it. <laughs> you had it made until you didn't. That's right. Because it started great yeah. and it didn't end well. No. What happened? Well, I basically got beaten up by CBC. By... Management. One, yeah, management and the executive producer of the program who didn't want me on the air anymore. I was then 50. I thought I was, did my job pretty well. The ratings were high. But, uh, yeah, I was basically beaten up. And I did not want to stick around and uh, take up their offer of uh, training uh, young reporters for, I think it was $40,000 a year. So we, we left. We went, we went back overseas. And within a year, ABC hired me because they thought I was still pretty good on the air. 
So you know, Steve, sometimes a kick in the teeth is just the kick you need. Because I had then 20 more years covering foreign news stories and doing what I love best. And by then, my beloved son was, you know, well, he was 13, four, you know, he was a young man. Not quite going out the door, but, you know, I felt that I could do that. And I had a kind, the kind of contract where I could be home for all his school vacations. So it was really, you know, a marriage made in heaven, you know, with ABC. That, that kid kind of grew up pretty tall, didn't he? Six foot eight. We told him <laughs> to stop growing. He wouldn't listen. <laughs> and what did he do for your husband? What, what did medically Jonathan do? Medically speaking. Oh, yes. Medically speaking, he saved his life because my husband developed kidney failure. And uh, Jonathan said, I want to give you my kidney. And I think if we'd even tried to talk him out of it, it would have been terrible. It would have been very emasculating for him. He was 22 at the time. And the genesis of that whole thing happened right here in Toronto. We were visiting Toronto at the time. And uh, friends, doctors said, you're not well. We're setting you up with a nephrologist at uh, Toronto General. Or, and they said, have you ever thought of a living donor transplant? Yes, well, Jonathan's right here. And Johnny jumps in and says, yeah, I want to do it. I want to do it. That's how it transpired. So we had the Canadians to thank for that, as well as Johnny himself. And he said, we, uh, friends of ours in, in, in England did a full-page uh, article about this called The Greatest Gift of All in the Daily Telegraph. She's a medical reporter. And Johnny said, at the age of 22, it's the best thing I've done in my life so far. I loved that. Did your husband try and talk him out of it? We did. Actually, we both tried to talk him out of it. Mm -hmm. Yes. I mean, yeah, John felt, uh, I, I can't ask my son to do this. I can't. It's a risk. Yeah. He, I mean, John was, John was ready to just uh, let nature take its, take its course. He did not want dialysis. He did not want to be tethered to a machine. That's very typical of, of my late husband, John. You know, he wouldn't want to go out that way. So, no, he, he had a couple of months to live, actually. But no, Johnny really wanted to do it. He fixed us with those blue eyes of his, and he was absolutely committed. Yeah. The letter J is a recurring letter when it comes to the <laughs> loves of your life. Shall we go through this? Oh, your late God. husband, John Bierman, mm -hmm. your wonderful son, Jonathan, yes. and your new husband, Jimmy. Jimmy, yes. How did Jimmy yes. come into your life, Hillary? Well, uh, a great friend of mine, one of my best friends, called Diane Francis, uh, and her husband, John Beck, who is the chairman of ACON, uh, had a party for me in uh, Toronto about uh, in 2011. I'm then living in uh, London and I've just retired. And after this dinner party, they say, you know, you should really meet this JD character who, oh yeah, I said, who's, who's he? Where does he live? He lives in Edmonton. Well, I said, you forget it. I mean, you might as well say he lives in Siberia. Anyway, I lived in London, so what is that? 6,000 miles between us. In any event, she persuades me to meet this guy. For, for dinner, as it happened, in London, where he had an apartment. And I walked into that restaurant. We had a rendezvous in a restaurant. And this guy, who's six foot three, gray blue eyes, million dollar smile, terrific physique, he stands up and Steve, I was a goner from the moment I clapped eyes on him. And I had no expectation whatsoever of, you know, what's an engineer from from Edmonton going to be like, short, fat, balding, boring, right? No, he wasn't any of those things. So that was kind of it. And I decided, oh, I guess I better leave London and get myself back to Canada and be nearer to this guy, this Canadian, who is a total crazy man. You know, he's a pilot, a skier, an adventurer. A, you know, he's a real life enhancer. Uh, and he likes to do crazy, life-threatening adventure holiday. Geez, who, who else is that like that I know? Hmm. <laughs> yeah. I, yeah. I can figure out what, yeah, what you yeah. two but saw this, each other. I mean, honestly, he kept me in a constant state of excitement and fear, which was kind of like being a foreign correspondent again, you know, like doing things that I had no experience of or aptitude for, such as, you know, deep powder skiing in British Columbia or whitewater rafting in down the Zambezi or rappelling down jungle waterfalls in Costa Rica. I mean, I was really convinced that this man was trying to get rid of me. <laughs> but lo... But you were married. Well, yes. As we, on our last, our first trip since the pandemic, we went to the Galapagos Islands, and you go via Quito, which is altitude, I think, 6,500 feet, or 9,500 feet above sea level. And he says to me, we go to a very smart dinner, uh, the restaurant for dinner, and he says, 
you know, your book should really have a 51st chapter. And I got quite annoyed. We well, my book has 50 chapters, a perfect symmetry. What do you mean? I got quite miffed. And he said, no, the 51st chapter should be about our marriage. At which point, I think my wine dribbled across <laughs> my blouse, which was black, fortunately. I couldn't think of anything to say except, well, I'm very flattered. And the second thing I said was, but I can't live with you in Edmonton. <laughs> and he said, that's all right. I don't want you to live with me. We'll just continue the way we are. So everyone says, you'll have a very happy marriage. <laughs> that's amazing. Yeah. Hillary, I've saved the most important question for last. What? Who is the greatest left-handed pitcher in the history of the ha, Dodgers? Ha, ha. Ha-ha. <laughs> said, go facts. And you said it right. I did. Want to tell the story of when you said it wrong? Well, yeah, I mean, okay. <laughs> uh, this was actually my first, my foray into news, which was when I was about 26, 27, and I wasn't allowed to, to, to report the news, but I was allowed to read the news. When was I allowed to read the news? Late at night, after the late, late movie, in CBC, Montreal. And the studio was a, a, a broom closet, basically, with a slave camera that was bolted to the wall. So it was just me, no technicians. And a, a, a script would come up from, you know, if, just without, without, a, without a writer, just a script would appear, and I'd read the script, yeah? So I'd read all the news, and the international news, and lo local news, and then we'd come to the sports news. And the name that kept cropping up was the name of Sandy Koufax. Now, that was spelled... K-O-U-F-A-X. Yes. I didn't know who Sandy Koufax was. I mean, I didn't know anything about sports, so I pronounced it the, the way it was spelled, which is Koufax. Nobody corrects me because nobody's watching it, right? <laughs> Except the guy downstairs in the newsroom who's writing this stuff, and it drives me crazy. This guy told me the story, thank God. He said he ran into me in the elevator one day in CBC, and he thought, there's that dumb broad who can't pronounce the name of Sandy Koufax. So he apparently turned to me and said, Sandy Koufax. And I apparently turned to him and said, Hillary Brown, and walked out of the elevator. <laughs> <laughs> Love that story. So Love do I, story. and thank God he told me this story. <laughs> Hillary, you've had a hell of a life, and there's still a lot more to go, obviously. Well, that's true. It ain't yeah. over till it's over. And I know who said that. Who said I that? I watched Yogi Berra. That was the great yoga. Yeah. Maharishi Yogi Berra. Exactly Absolutely. Right. Absolutely. In the meantime, we are happy to recommend your War Tourist, Memoirs of a Foreign Correspondent, which is a fantastic read. And um, <laughs> lots of luck and love going forward. Thank you so much, Steve. It's been such a pleasure to be with you again. And that is the agenda for Wednesday, June 15th, 2022. Tomorrow, we'll hear from criminologist Michael Arntfield about why there's a growing need for expertise in solving cold cases. Also, Nam Kiwanuka talks to the first candidate elected as an independent in Ontario since the 1990s. I'm Steve Pakin. Thanks for watching TVO, for joining us online at TVO.org. And Nam and I will see you back here tomorrow. The Agenda with Steve Pagan is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism.